Okay. Uh, I hear by the year 2011, they'll solve a live stream. It'll be pretty easy. I know, right? Okay. Oh, shit. Now we look uh, like we're good on Twitch. Uh, so maybe that, uh, maybe that fixed things. Uh, are things good for you guys now? Awesome. Awesome. Uh, rad. All right. Well, uh, then I think we are, uh, ready to go. Uh, 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 chat. Do you, are you guys getting my audio, uh, clear or do I sound bad? Uh, well, as soon as we get a review on the audio to see if I got to, uh, change shit, then, uh, otherwise we can just rock and roll. Maybe a bit hot, a bit hot. Here, let me put on my phones. Check, check, check. Oh, there we go. Need that. Uh, 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 Andrew, can you talk? I'm talking out of my mouth. It's what I do when I talk. I say these things, sometimes without even thinking. Like, I have fantasies about zebras. Uh, zebras, huh? Can't can't tell you why. Can't tell it's you why. True. The zebras. Never did. Yeah. Okay, so that looks audio level-wise uh, a little bit closer. That sounds much better. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, all right. Well, if that is, uh, if that's good, then we will go ahead and get this, uh, get this party started. Let's take this party boat out into international waters. Uh, okay. Here we go. Starting things in a three, two. Hello and welcome to weird. Oh wait, shit. No, you're here, Andrew. All right, let me stop that and you start it and you do the intro. I, for whatever reason, I just got to do. I got to do. All good. Uh, I'm just tweeting it out now. Host mode. Okay. Well, then you let me know when you're ready to go. Just give me a count me in. Count me in, boss. Okay. <clears throat> here we go. And three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by my permanent co-host and the only co-host that ever matters, <laughs> Justin Robert Young. Oh, it's happy, 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 happy to be here. Brian is preparing for his TEDx talk tomorrow. Uh, he might join us for a little bit after things, but uh, it is just me and you, Andrew, as we do weird things. And it is a celebratory weird things, right? Uh, it's pretty, pretty exciting week, uh, in general, other than the terrifying things been going on between, uh, Houston hurricane heading towards our family in Florida yep. and the, uh, brush fires out here in Burbank where I could stand out in front of my house and watch what looked like Mordor. Other than that, <laughs> things are great. Other than that, of course, yeah, the world is falling apart, but th there's this theory that uh my buddy ken ken montgomery as you know uh the guy the guy you replaced is my friend yeah um uh there's i have this sort of weird fight off thing i make my friends go through uh by the way ma I, make make your friends go through beats you just harass your 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 friends old and new by just calling them either old and new versions of their other <laughs> of their names right so i i only have a capacity to like keep like track of one relationship <laughs> at a time so um it's uh my buddy ken um when i got like my first big deal was like my first big cruise ship job i was a teenager and i got hired to work on a ship for like six months really well paid whatever ken went to ken like went to go see me off and then like he he, he was there at the airport whatever and then i think he overslept or something and he got fired from his job at the movie theater, right? Oh, no. Oh, Ken, when I come went, on. When I got my job, when I got my Japan contract, he got fired from some other job for something or whatever. It was just this, it was like we said that like whenever something good happened to me, something bad happened to Ken. Okay. And so when I got the TV show, I'm like, you've been to the doctor, right? Yeah. You're, 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 you're good. Okay. And so it's this weird karmic kind of thing, maybe. I don't know. I'm sorry. 
So wait, hold on. Wait, wait. Is Ken dead? Like, is this your way of no, telling Ken, me that Ken, Ken survived died? that one? Ken survived that. So. Well, then I mean, you have good news. Like, why, why are you why are you dancing around this? Tell everybody the great news. Uh, so I mean, you know, I'm a modest guy, and I hate to toot my own <laughs> sure. horn. Sure. Uh, but uh, as we speak, the number one book on Amazon uh, is The Naturalist. The what? My book. The my book. Wait, the Naturalist. Wait, whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on. Wait a minute. Uh, so you're telling me if people go to Kindle bestsellers, right, they just Google that, the, the top books that are, are the top Kindle books on Amazon, full stop, right? Like well, not top books. Actually, all books, including Kindle. All books. All books. All books. And uh, if they do this right now, if they do this, like... 12 hours from now or whatever. But I mean, it was all day. It was, it was for two or three days for three days straight. It was nonstop yesterday dipped down to number two. Then right now it's number one again, but we'll see. But yes, the answer is I've had, I've had for four days now. I've had the number one book on Amazon. Now, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, trying to, trying to find this here. Uh, uh, just so we can, just so we can show exactly what is, uh, what, what is, what is happening here. Uh, there we go. Look at that. Number one, top of the plow, gosh darn humdinger, gold cup, uh, blue ribbon, giant foam finger. Number one, the naturalist by Andrew Main. You are you are the champion, my friend. Yeah, I mean it's kind of cool. Um, <laughs> well, here, all right. So, so uh, uh, where where do we want to uh, uh, put this? We, uh, let's let's let everybody know that you can go ahead and buy. The Naturalist right now, uh, Kindle paperback. It is it is now a uh, for sale. And uh, uh, do, is is the Kindle first thing still going on? Uh, yeah. So the Kindle first thing is all this month. Uh, my book was selected as the the was selected as one of, as like the thriller mystery for that. Which means that if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, the United States, UK, or Australia. You can download it for free. You can get it free as part of being an Amazon Prime member, um, which certainly helped my book because it doesn't come out till October 1st. Let's, let's not kid around as far as – but uh, a number of books get selected for that every month, um, and I'm very, very fortunate because I have the awesome support of people out there like our listeners, et cetera, that, that just jumped right into the book and said very nice things about it which I'm very grateful for. And so. and and by the way, uh their uh, the, the reviews on this, these are user reviews that have come in have uh kept this thing at at four and a half stars, right? Like this is yeah. uh this is extraordinarily well reviewed. Yeah, it's been very very well received. I'm very happy with that. You know, when you write something that you you're passionate about, you just hope that it connects with people and I feel very very lucky by that. You know, we we do a podcast where we like to mix kind of cool stuff and science and all that. And as you know, when I started writing, I wanted to sort of take a little bit of spirit of what Weird Things was about and put that into my writing. So A hundred percent. Now, this was something that uh, – all right, so, so do we want to get into some of the business stuff now or on or on After Things? Um, I say we do that in After Things. Okay. We've we'll, we'll, we'll got some cool weird stories. I don't want to bore people to death with this. But by you know, you can check out – if you're an Amazon Prime subscriber, you can get The Naturalist for free right now as part of your Prime membership or you can pre-order it. Comes out October first in paperback, Kindle version, uh, audiobook, MP3 audio, etc. But right now, the Kindle version is free for Amazon Prime subscribers. So, uh, it, as a Kindle first selection, and if you like it, please leave a review. If you read something else that's not mine and you like what they did, please write a review. Write it a really, review. Really, really. We yeah. are pro reviews. Pro reviews yeah. here. I write reviews. I endorse stuff all the time because I want to support things, and I know I know how much it matters to me when I get a good review and somebody supports what I'm doing because it's just – you have no idea how much influence you have with just one really good review. You really, really have – you know, more than the book's editor for a local newspaper in all seriousness, particularly uh, when a book first launches and is out there. I, let me let me just say this is something that is extraordinarily uh, – I, I, I'm so extraordinarily proud of – your uh, achievement here. This is a fantastic book, and uh, uh, listen, the the, uh, the 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 reviews bear it out. I mean, uh, the, this thing has been in people's hands now uh, uh, for for the Kindle side for a little bit for the last couple of days since this has been up here. You have been uh, 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 spent the majority of the last. 
four days, the vast majority of the past four days at the number one spot, there's a there are a lot of eyeballs on this, and uh, the the word is coming back extraordinarily positive. So uh, I am I am thrilled thrilled uh, to see how this is going. Thank you, thank you very much. I appreciate the support of everybody out there. But you know what? What? Let's talk about a really amazing achievement. Let's go. Peggy Whitson. Peggy Whitson is a rock star. Peggy Whitson is kind of really awesome and rocking and amazing. She returned to Earth today. She spent 665 days on board the International Space Station, uh, station breaking all kinds of records, breaking the record for an American astronaut. The Russians hold the record, but they kind of leave their guys up there and forget they're there. But she broke the, the record for that. 665 days in space. And I'm going to say this, not that it matters, but it's kind of cool. She's 56. If you're thinking about like, man, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do? This woman, 56, which qualifies as retirement in many federal departments and agencies and is somebody who could run laps around Justin and I, the superhuman specimen of a person, has done an amazing achievement. The record for a U.S. astronaut in space has been set by Peggy. Happens to be a woman. Not that it's important, but just so you know, yeah. kind of really rocking and awesome. So, uh, and she did a lot of great science up there. I am, as you know, I am super, super into space science and microgravity research, and that's what just gets me so excited is the idea of having a researcher up there, able to do some interesting stuff. She did some stuff involving uh, plant growth, eye development, etc. Not to mention what she volunteered her own body. Her own body is a research subject. Her own body is being used to measure the effects of long-term exposure in space. I mean, that's almost that's almost two years in space, two years in weightlessness, which is kind of cool. And she also did, you know, uh, became the oldest woman astronaut to complete a spacewalk. It's not like she just sat around inside. She went out and got stuff done. So hats off to a hero, space hero, hero Peggy Whitson. That's just Amazing. That's that's crazy. Uh, 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 and how old again? Fifty six. Fifty six years old, and 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 now has the record. Uh, do you think that this is something that uh, 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 certainly a monumental achievement in in the age that uh, she has earned it in? But you would imagine that hopefully th th this is a record that gets broken. Uh, uh, sooner rather than later as we send more people into space within the next, you know, the, certainly the next 20, 30 years, right? Yeah, I think that, you know, she, like Mark Kelly, who who was another one person to longevity, and the cosmonauts have been up there, they're trailblazers. They're, it's harder for them to do this now than it will be later on because we don't know enough about this. It's still, what are the right exercises? What are the right vitamins? How do yeah. you prevent the deteriorating effects? And so that, yeah, these records are going to be broken again and again, and we're eventually going to have people who are born in space and live there, but hopefully in some sort of, you know, gravity environment. <laughs> sure. But what they're doing right now is making it possible for the rest of us to go up there and have a safer experience in future astronauts, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, it's going to get, you know, it's it's the first transatlantic fight. You know, when Lindbergh did that, kind of cool. You yeah. Know? I mean, cool if he wasn't such a, you know, a racist, but, uh, you know, kind <laughs> of an, an amazing achievement. You know, we, you and I've done that now, and nobody was there to cheer us and pop champagne bottles for us. Yeah, yeah, no, seriously. So, is is this kind of comparable to a a pioneer? Like, like is this is this the you know the 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 Oregon Trail of our of our era? People that have uh, trailblazed what it's like to spend this much time in space. Certainly think so. I think that it's. It's pushing the limits of human endeavor in places that you know are just beyond, uh, you know, you know, beyond what we've done before, you know? Uh, and I think that, oh, wait, I'm trying to think, uh, all right, this mission was 288 days. I think it's cumulatively she's done 665 days, uh -huh. just to correct, make a correction there. But yeah, I think that what what's happening right now is kind of an amazing, uh, you know, achievement. And she broke the record back in April for an American astronaut, but she stayed an extra three months because she felt like it. She wanted to stay, you know, three months longer in space. And that's, you know, that kind of dedication to make things happen is just kind of phenomenal. That is, that is, uh, uh, that is fantastic. So a big, 
big hats off. Uh, and now she is she is back on Earth, safe and sound. Yep, yep, back on Earth after taking a uh, you know a, a Soyuz reentry, which is always uh, apparently very very nerve wracking. So kind of kind of incredible. So what a uh, what a great hero to, to us all. And just 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 to anybody listening out there who has you know some ambition, something you want to do, it's you know your 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 peak years are way ahead of you. Sure, absolutely. Uh, uh, and listen, she is a hero uh, for for all of us. Somebody that we can all look up to and take strength from. But you can also be a hero. Uh, that is, if you go ahead and support us at Patreon dot com slash weird things uh, that is where you get the chance to make sure that we continue to rock this show each and every week in fact it can be said that if it were not for uh, patreon.com slash weird things you know maybe this would have been a chance to take a week off you know uh, there's there's a lot that's going on uh, uh brian has a, a a tedx talk coming up uh, uh bryce Got some really funky con crud from uh, uh, Dragon Con. I just got back in town from Dragon Con as well. But the, the the beat must go on because you guys have chosen to support us at patreon.com slash weird things. Where not only do you get the uh, uh, smile in your heart that you made sure that this show kept going. You also get access, early access to the show and access to after things, which is our creative uh, endeavor that we do right after weird things. So go ahead and check us out. Patreon.com slash weird things. Justin, I want you to imagine that you've uh, you've taken a, a different path in your life, maybe one that's led you to the other side of the law. Oh, and, okay. Uh, I'm an I'm an outlaw. It, okay. Maybe you've stolen a car. Maybe you've uh you know committed a robbery. Maybe you've done something that uh you shouldn't have done. And you decide that you're going to try to flee the cops. The cops are chasing after you, right? Okay. And then you say, you know what I'm going to do is uh, you, you're getting pulled over because maybe you have something in your car you shouldn't have, whatever. And you see the ocean. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to swim for it. You're going to swim? Okay, all right. So I'm I'm on the run from the fuzz. Uh, I, know, I know I'm guilty. I'm going to go to jail. Uh, I'm, I'm now in the ocean. I'm going to try and swim for my, for my life, really. And I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a link in a moment here. And I, man, like, I kept thinking this has got to be a hoax, and I'm waiting to find out that it is a hoax. But as okay. far as I can tell, this is actually like a real thing. Um, so you're out there swimming away from the cops, and you're kind of like, all right, guys, got away, uh, suck it, maybe you roll around to flip them off, whatever. Um, what would what would be the worst thing that could happen short of death <laughs> okay so short obviously listen you're putting yourself in the in in the situation where if you are not a good swimmer or or you have some other kind of injury that obviously drowning is going to be a large possibility uh short now, of the police send up a drone to follow you oh and wow like, oh, you think you're gonna get away we got a drone to follow you because this is the future I, maybe you forgot it's the future uh well uh, never I'll, I'll be I'll be immediately surprised as I remember it's indeed the future and now the buzzing that I'm hearing <laughs> is not a, uh, a a a upset hornet's nest or beehive it is indeed a drone that is uh that is that is trailing me uh all right the worst thing that can happen short of death would be to be maimed by some kind of animal and immediately what pops to mind is that I am attacked by a shark uh i want you to check your email and i want you to click on a link there and uh it, it, it didn't get so dire it didn't get that dire but they're watching the footage of this man fleeing away from the cops and what do they see okay hold on i'm gonna uh i'm gonna play this for everybody uh here we go uh, uh the headline from port city daily is drone footage, man flees Surf City uh, police by swimming a mile out to sea. Uh, he is then pursued by a shark. Let's, uh, let, let's go ahead and go to this footage here. We are watching this man uh, swimming to avoid police. Oh, my God. 
there would look to be something behind him. Wait a minute. Where? So is, is it this, below? Is it the, is it below in the lower part of the frame there? Yeah, the lower part of the frame. Hold on, wait. Let me pull this. Uh, yeah, lower right, you can see. Let me pull this right out above here. the YouTube logo. He's being shadowed by a shark. Oh my lanta! Here we go. Yeah. All right, low, <laughs> lower right hand portion, and I'll zoom in on it in a second. But there we go. He is uh, uh, being shadowed by a shark to his right. Let's go ahead and uh, uh, enhance, enhance, enhance. Obviously, uh, there is uh, the man right there. But let's also go ahead and take a look. This is, uh, you know, say hello to his little friend, uh, this shark right here in the corner let's uh let's go ahead and bring that up there we go uh <laughs> we can see that guy oh my god and he doesn't even know what the no. hell's going on yeah uh, the police canine shark unit we got drones we got sharks oh my um, god uh but i, I I, you know, it's funny as I said it flippantly because it's the future. I didn't realize it makes sense. I didn't realize it. Like, police are now like, oh, you're going to get away. Okay, pull out the drone and we'll just track you with this. I mean, it's it's kind of brilliant, right? Because, yeah. uh, uh, you know, even in, in, in Los Angeles, famously, there is this culture of police chases, right? And it yep. winds up getting coverage and, and, and the local television uses their, their helicopters to keep track of it. it 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 is riveting television and yet horrifyingly unsafe for everybody involved including innocent bystanders that just happen to be on these highways but when you think about it the the drone kind of solves all those problems right somebody mm -hmm. is is on the road okay fine we'll just keep a drone it'll be over you uh uh there there won't be flashing lights it'll just follow you to where you're going and <laughs> eventually we'll just figure it out We'll find out where you are, and you know, then we'll send uh, the, the 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 SWAT in to to make sure that you uh, you you get brought to justice. And then the sharks we'll send the sharks in too. And then, of course, yeah, if you try to jump into the marina and swim to some, I mean, where else are you going? Like, is you, is your friend running some renegade riverboat gambling operation that you're gonna jump in, or you're gonna find a cigarette boat that'll take you out to international waters? <laughs> Maybe he's Aquaman. Maybe. This is the beginning of a Justice League viral video. Sure, yeah. But if he's Aquaman, then he has nothing to worry about with the shark, right? Yeah, they're friends. Unless he like works for like a like mantis or whatever the enemy is. I forget. Yeah. My Aquaman lore. Or maybe it's a it, it's finally the the Namor uh, or or Namor Aquaman fight that we've been spoiling for for all these years. Yeah. Dare to dream. <laughs> uh <clears throat> Justin, are you feeling a, a little bit anxious, a little bit unnerved right now? Uh, I'm a fairly anxious person, so uh, uh, yeah, that's that's usually a fairly safe bet. You know, I went on Saturday and I saw in the big screen Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Oh, wow. A friend of mine, Paul Hynek, his father is the J. Allen Hynek who wrote Project Blue Book, which Steven Spielberg got the rights to and then used that as a starting point to make the movie Close Encounters, because Spielberg... Spielberg in the post Watergate era wanted to do a story about a conspiracy of what if the government was hiding evidence of aliens. Right? Yeah. And uh, I think it's a, a great story. I'm, I'm inclined to believe the answer to that is a, a firm no. Sure. Uh, but uh, it's still it's fun. And the movie's wonderful. Even watching the movie. I have the movie on uh, I've got a Blu-ray. I have it on, you know, digital and I've had both versions of it or multiple versions of it. I love watching. It was great to watch it again in the theaters because it's an extremely well done Spielberg movie. You see things that he understood great, like characters talking over each other, a very realistic domestic kind of life, et cetera. But aliens. Yeah. The idea that they're out there. And kind of what was cool that he did was Spielberg made the encounter with them so more grandiose 
and strange than just a UFO lands like, hey, we're aliens. It was yeah. still mysterious. You know, the movie ended with like, we don't know anything about them. Yeah. You know? Um, which is cool. Which I mean, like we we know as much about those aliens at the end of the movie as natives would Europeans as they come to the you know uh, the, the the shores of the United States, right? And and it's just a, a foreign concept of people that are they they you know are they speak different cultures are different their concepts are all different. It's just it's you know there's no reason why there there should be some plot device where. Somebody mind melds and is like, oh, finally, I get everything. We've been searching the skies for evidence of extraterrestrials. And it's one of these things that I think people who often believers of more extreme points of view on it, I think they're convinced that they're here, they're visiting us, kind of create straw man argument and say like, ah, well, it's ridiculous to think that we're all alone. It's like, I don't. The only people I've ever met that think that we would be all alone in the universe tend to be maybe people like myself who suggest it just because of just the probabilistic chances and the likelihood of developing, you know, do, you know, is intelligent life tool making things like we do. Is it really the end point of evolution or not? I don't know. And I'm not against the idea. I think the universe is so big, it would seem likely there would be all sorts of things out there because it's really, really huge. I've never encountered a religious person that was convinced that we were all alone. In fact, most religious people I know would think that, well, you know, if God created Earth, why wouldn't he create other worlds? Scientists, you know, generally think that, like, you know, they might be like, well, the, that more dismissive on the idea that we'd ever make contact. But the idea the universe is so big and the evidence for life being able to form seems to be, you know, overwhelming. I don't know anybody who thinks that we're all alone, who's convinced 100 percent that we're all alone. I'm probably the most skeptical person I know about that. And I'm not even I'm just as a let me play devil's advocate because we take some things and assume that they're easier than others. Sure. But, so, you know, the, the idea that, you know, every NASA scientist, every I talk to, you know, they're all like, yeah, it would seem it would seem it would be more odd if there was no other life out there and even intelligent life, given the size of the universe. So. There have been a number of projects, like Project Steady, uh, and then there's uh, been a, another search. Uh, Yuri Milner, who is a uh, Russian billionaire, um, who has funded uh, a, a telescope array project to try to look for signs of intelligent life out there. And one of the things that's happened has been we've observed these fast radio bursts. And okay. fast radio bursts are pretty much what they sound like. There are a series of radio bursts coming from one specific spot that, uh, in this case, coming from the direction of a distant galaxy, which is, you know, kind of even more peculiar and odd. And so what's happened is we've had just on August 26, we had another series of these that were observed. And it's peculiar because we 15 pulses are detected within five hours and they have like, you know, 500 terabytes of data were, were collected on this. And they have a lot of different theories on what this could be, but no strong front runner from this. Um, the scientists at Breakthrough Listen, which is the project that observed this, which is actually a project trying to listen for intelligent life, they think that it's probably a natural phenomenon. You know, we yeah. don't understand it, but we're kind of of the idea that it's probably a natural phenomenon because, you know, it's such a massive scale and doesn't seem like it's something that's directed at us. Uh, but it could be neutron stars, black holes, et cetera. But they don't think that it's likely to be ETs. But it's just evidence of just how weird and strange the universe is. And right now, what that pro and this is to show you, these are the people looking for an alien life. Yeah. And they're like, no, nah, we don't think this is alien. We don't know what this is, but we're not going to be like, it's aliens. <laughs> but what it does tell us, though, is that, you know, a thing we've discussed here is that if we do get evidence of alien life, it may not be. One day we're like, hey, we're alone. The next day, like, hey, we proof. We know everything we know. It might be a weird signal that yeah. we're thinking that it could be. And there's been you know, more talk about the idea that it could be a slow realization of we're listening to an alien civilization. So if that is the case, at, at what point do we say this has gone from, all right, this is a, you know, a, a bunch of random noise uh, to... Holy crap! This is this is a really a thing. Like, what 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 is that threshold? What needs to happen? You know, if we're picking up a signal, and let's say, and we've talked about the difference between intentional signals and unintentional signals. 
if it's an unintentional signal and we're picking up what may be, you know, a, a radio communications burst or something from another planet, uh, which would be kind of hard if it wasn't directed at us. But if we did pick something up and we got a fragment of something, we're going to have a bunch of questions. We're gonna, one, we're gonna, like, it, did it really come from there? That'll be the big one. Did it really, really come from there? In the in the book, uh, Contact, you know, the movie Contact, kind of people fell upon, well, we think it was a hoax by this guy who's not unlike Yuri Milliner, this this yeah. billionaire who was trying to find it. And they kind of, people sort of cited, you know what, maybe it was a hoax after all, right? Yeah. Uh, because it was just, the evidence was not overwhelmingly there. It you, you spend a long time with fragments of evidence trying to think maybe there's something here, maybe. And then you have the sea change and everybody's like, yeah, of course, we do all along. And it's like, wait, yeah, we didn't. And now we, we forget that period of indeterminacy. So I think what would happen is, if we got a fragmentary signal, and let's say it had images or other stuff like that, we're going to want to try to determine, did it really come from there? That'll be a big question. Could this have been fake? Could this have been spoofed? Then we're going to be very curious about the algorithms. Like if we got just a basic, like a, just a simple image, we'll be like, you know, are were, were we trying to decode this with systems that had a bias? Were they going to just try to find an image no matter what? What happens if we put other data in there? It's this we'll go through this period of just not knowing it'll become a matter of like, maybe this, maybe that if it's a fragment. Yeah. And then oh. maybe it'll build over time. I mean, wow. I, I guess I can't even wrap my head around what the cultural impact of that would be. Like, like what, what does the, 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 the day after we get something like that, is it like at some point, it breaks out of the science nerd category and becomes just the biggest story on the planet, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that in my very limited mind, and I'm going to be wrong, but I see three. If if we get contact, yeah. either there's an unintentional contact, which is going to be very frustrating and very confusing because we're not going to have a certainty about it, and it's going to be confusing if you just got you know, uh, a test pattern signal from us. You know, if you've got, <laughs> if you manage to get just two minutes of a cell phone conversation and not knowing anything about English or whatever, you might, you know, wonder, you know, yeah, maybe, maybe there's a species of whale on some other planet that uses, you know, electromagnetic communication. And for some reason it got boosted or yeah. it's a star, it's a star quake and a very weird thing. There are a lot of phenomenon that sound organic, but they're not. And if we have no experience with what's creating it, then who knows? But if we had an intentional signal, it could be one of three. Again, I'm wrong on this, but I, in my mind, be one of three scenarios. You either have a singular civilization, a singular civilization, you know, like us, that develops the ability to contact. Yeah. Okay. Uh, which it could be very, very alien and very, very bizarre because, you know, if you haven't contacted other civilizations, it, there's a learning curve. I would, you know, we had a learning curve. Our best explorers were people that had contacted other civilizations and said, you've got to learn their customs. You've got to learn, you know, how to speak their language. You've got to adapt very quickly. Don't make a lot of assumptions about how similar you are and they are, you know, and you look at even, even uh, there's a, an interesting movie right now, Scorsese's The Silence, which is about some Jesuits going yeah. in search of another one in Japan, in, you know, feudal Japan in a period in which Japan was extremely isolated. And it's a very alien environment, extremely alien environment that, that is resistant to change. They had killed all the other priests before because the feudal warlords are like, you know what, we don't want any outside. We like what we're doing. We don't want you coming in here and changing things. And these are people who are you know, genetically the same as us. Yeah. But in that period of time, it was you know more alien than you could even imagine. When conquistadors came to South America, encountered these massive civilizations that have been thriving for hundreds of years, it was, and we're the same, you know, but it was alien. So you imagine an alien civilization that is totally divergent from us, totally different from us, even if they have a high level of technology, they may have arrived at it from a very different point of view. Yeah, it's alien is the word. It's going to be utterly alien. That is the one scenario. Second scenario is if you've encountered alien civilizations that have contacted other alien civilizations, then it's different. When you go to major cities that have been port cities, let's say Hong Kong, Shanghai, you know, uh, Miami, et cetera, you yeah. see a lot of similarities because cultures that have to deal with other cultures learn very quickly how to get along, yeah. how to get along and, and, and sort of 
function that way. And you can feel, you know, if you want to go somewhere and travel, if you go to a port city that gets a lot of traffic, you're going to be fine. You're, you're going to, I'm not going to say fine, but it's easier to get there because they're used to strangers. So cultures that are a combination of cultures, if it's multiple aliens, whatever, then yeah, that'll be different. They're going to be a little bit smarter in how to deal with us and have a little more savvy on that. Third scenario, if it's AI. Okay, so it, it, it's an artificial intelligence that is is now communicating with us. Then, uh, yeah, I mean, how how do we even <laughs> where do we even go from there? Well, in, in in the other situations, it could be an AI acting as an intermediary. But if it's an AI that's sort of taken over, or you know, a dominant AI or whatever, then it's like I have no idea. You know, it's going to be like what it you know it, it could be benevolent. It could be it could be not even care, won't even communicate, only communicates to send us viruses and stuff to take over or whatever. But who knows? Whatever scenario I can imagine is not what it is. Oh, my God. What would you prefer? All right, I'm, I'm giving you the choice. What would be the one that would bring, uh, uh, um, I guess, either more prosperity or less risk to Earth? if they communicated and, and therefore insinuating that we could go further with our communication with them. Multicultural. Multicultural. That's, that's, that's what we're rooting for. Yeah. Yeah. The culture from, you know, uh, the culture from, you know, the, the Ian Banks type novels, that kind of thing, you know, a, a less fascist version of the Federation uh, <laughs> or the United Federation of Planets, you know, a more whatever kind of thing. I, that's what I would think would be the best case scenario. It's a sort of like uh, in, a, in a, you know, an organization based on trade. Trade is trade is wonderful. Trade is saying you can do something. You're different. And by the very nature of you being different, you have things that are of value to us. There's value. So there. I, yeah, we can yeah. we can not just be uh, useless. Yeah, exactly. So that'd be my preference. You know, that would I think that would be the best case scenario. I I'm going to have to go ahead and agree, although. Really, uh, uh, you know, the 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 A.I. example is just the one that's just so out there that that, you know. We don't we don't know. We don't know how we will react to A.I. or how, how A.I. will react to us. You know, it's just a big a big a big guessing game where really the most cautious are just like, hey, we. We don't know where this goes, but we know how bad the bad side of this can go. <laughs> so uh, we need to, on our end, in in, in the development of it, uh, be very cautious. Did you did you read the uh, the the Putin quote that the uh, the civil you know the 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 people that create the most sophisticated AI will will rule the world? Uh, yeah. And, you know, Elon Musk talking about, you know, World War Three would be about AI. I, yeah, I think there is something to that. I think that it is a, a, you know, and Brian's not here, so we don't get, you know, the, the full variety of opinions that we normally have on that because, yeah. you know, Brian and I sort of take different points of view on that. So I, I won't, I won't speak for him on that, but my, you know, my take on it is that, you know, when we think about AI, a sophisticated AI, AI is a lot of complex systems working together. And part of those systems are being able to, you know, we we as humans, we've evolved because we try to repair damage in our DNA and we try to improve upon how we function our environment. Humans are not the same that we were for what we were designed for 100 billion years ago or a million years ago, et cetera. You know, 100 million years ago, we were, you know monkeys yeah you know and you know then we lost our tails like other apes and you know evolved with you know and had a common ancestors other apes and became us and then diverged and so we're an example of software that's constantly rewriting itself you're born and you have this example but gen 2 gen 3 your children your progeny change and evolve over time to whatever is the maximum you know utility and, and it depends on what that is you know when you're talking about an ai agent there's there's several scary situations one is you just develop a really, really great, brilliant, or really powerful AI program that does a purpose that says, hey, uh, cripple the United States economy. Yeah. And go. And it's, go. Uh, which it says, oh, I'm going to look for all sorts of open ports and financial systems. I'm going to hack JP Morgan and all these other places. I'm going to have them start making really ridiculous trades. 
and I'm going to bankrupt these systems, forcing people to have to restart, you know, the, the Dow Jones, the NASDAQ, whatever. Meanwhile, I'm going to collapse pension funds and I'm going to send, you know, cause unemployment, et cetera, blah, 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 which on one hand sounds a little bit, well, if you're looking at, if you're following machine learning and you're following how quickly these things, computers are learning how to, in simple situations, think like people, it's not that far fetched. It's really, really not. Yeah. You know, I, I you would almost bet that if if you look at the frequency of you know these blackmail operations uh uh you know this is happening i i would i would say that number one a lot of it doesn't come out because people pay blackmail and it it doesn't get reported on right but mm -hmm. i think it is an underreported element of our society right now that could have tremendous ramifications cuz i i do not think it is far fetched for us to have something that greatly affects key financial institutions, be it through espionage uh, from other countries or just rogue outfits. Because, uh, again, it's it's the people that wield the sword that really have the power. There's no guarantee that they're going to be loyal to national constructs. You know, I'll give you, and we've talked about it before, and I don't know if everybody sort of knows the story of Stuxnet. And, yeah. and, and not to say that I'm an expert on it, which I'm not, but... When the Iranians were working towards developing their own nuclear weapons, one of the most critical things you need to do is you need to take uranium and you got to refine it because actually the rock, the ore you get, the part, the useful part of the uranium that you want, the isotope you want, is in a very, very, very small quantity in there. And essentially what you do is you put it inside of a centrifuge and spend it for days and weeks and whatnot in separating the heavier elements from the lighter elements. That's how you refine uranium. So Iran had uh, hundreds of centrifuges, hundreds of centrifuges they were using to process uranium so they could refine it and then get the core uranium. Once you have that uranium, you can do dirty bombs, you can make a regular atomic bomb, et cetera. Certain parties, of which we don't know who they are, but we kind of know who they are, yeah. were not happy about the idea of Iran getting a nuclear bomb. Let's, and, let's, let's take a, 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 just for laughs, call them, America and Schmisrael. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Yeah. Shmerica Israel decided, yeah, this would not be in our best intention because this is this is an this is a country that is openly hostile towards us and them. You know, when their leaders, their political platforms aren't, you know, we're gonna be number one, we're it is we're going to destroy these other countries. Now, granted, it's kind of what you have to say to, you know, maintain power there. Yeah. But you're getting power because there are a lot of people that want to hear you say you're going to destroy us. Yes. So, um, so what do you do? And, you know, there had been a number of cases where, you know, Iran would build a nuclear facility and then uh, people, you know, jets would maybe leave Israel and go bomb that facility and then bring it back down to the Stone Age. There are other examples of, you know, you might be a leading Iranian nuclear scientist and you hop into your little your your motorcade and you're in your limousine and you're being carried from one place to the next and you hear the sound of a motorcycle whizzing by and thunk, something gets attached to the door of your car. Yeah. And moments later, a bomb goes off. And, and the next thing you know, there is no car or you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so those are some of the things, the goal of which was, you know, to prevent Iran from doing this. But one of the more clever things was these centrifuge systems, which were built by, I forget, like Siebold or Dun I forget who built these, but these are run by computers. These are computer controlled centrifuges and they're networked and they have to have software updates and that cetera to keep going. At some point, a worm, not a virus, but technically a worm infected the centrifuges and what got into one of the system, and it was just, it was a cleverly designed piece of software designed to spread from computer to computer to computer. And it was like, well, if you're a centrifuge and you're in Iran, we've got a new way for you to work. Yeah. And they cause these things. And a centrifuge is a motor, a big electric motor, and it's a set cylinder, and it spins it at ridiculously sp high speeds. This worm was causing these centrifuges to spin extremely fast and break apart and basically just destroyed them. Yeah, centrifuge and entire destroyed like their entire program for a while and spread and they would try to take them offline and put other ones into place and the worm would show up magically back inside of there and do this. So here Stuxnet. we go. This is this is uh, this is from Wikipedia. Stuxnet has three modules: a worm that uh, executes all routines related to the main payload of the attack, 
a link file that automatically executes the propagated uh, copies of the worm and a rootkit component responsible for hiding all malicious files and processes, preventing detection and the presence of Stuxnet. Uh, it is introduced via a USB flash drive. So that's all you needed is to get somebody into where those are networked, stick in a USB flash drive, and you are good to go. That's one of the ways in which you can introduce things. Yeah. And there are other systems at play, too, because once you stop thinking like a human engineer and you just start thinking about systems in general, you realize that, oh, you know, I could put a... I could put a little piece of software on board somebody's computer that all it did was open up the microphone port and listen yeah, and not have anything else there. But at some point, if it gets a series of commands, you know, a couple of different pitch tones and maybe an ultrasonic frequency by somebody's cell phone in there, it can all of a sudden start to write a program to a file. This is this has been done. This yeah. is the thing. And you would think like, no, my computer's not networked. It's not plugged in. Oh, guess what? You've got a microphone port or you got Bluetooth. You know, if you, you know, forget, you know, don't even have your Bluetooth on, whatever. But if you have a microphone port on there. But there can be other things, too, is you could have non. You could say I've shut down all of my ports. I'm like, OK, you've got a temperature sensor in there. OK, yeah. you're going to still have some things monitoring some forms of RF. You've actually got a keyboard. You've got you may have a camera, but you tape over the camera. But maybe the camera you could have a camera. Imagine this. You have a camera, but you put a post-it note over the camera, right? So it can't see anything. Okay. Sure. I could still, if I had a little tiny bit of code inside of there, I could hack your computer. If I had a bit of code that was looking for, if all of a sudden I controlled the light grid and I turned lights on and off. Yeah. And I could send a series of Morse code and do this. Again, these are dumb ideas for me. The people doing yeah. this have good ideas, you know, and that's that's the world we're living in. And we have now we've had actual e examples in the laboratory of artificial intelligence systems figuring out how to hack other systems. They've figured out like, oh, you know, I can I can hack this other computer. I can listen to what it's saying because it's giving off this RF frequency. I can influence it because I found out that I can cause this change there, et cetera. There's a thing called uh, Rowhammer. We talked about Rowhammer before. Uh, so, I don't think we have. So let's say you have a microchip, right? Okay. And you say, this is a super secure microchip. I have, I use encryption. This thing's totally locked down. You're not going to be able to hack my computer because of this. Now I can send requests to your computer though. I can go to your, you have an open port and I can say, hey, you know, can I have access? Your computer can go, no, you may not. I'm like, all right, <laughs> can I have access now? No, you may not. Well, on that microchip, the thing is, is that you have rows of transistors that are physically close to other transistors. And one row of transistors might be part of an open part of the chip. And that other row of transistors is part of a closed part of the chip. Now, in theory, this microchip, there's no way you could hack it. There's no way because you would need a super huge encryption algorithm. You, you checked everything. But physically, if I send a series of requests to that row of transistors over and over again, I can actually get one of those transistors on that other side to maybe malfunction to flip a bit or whatever to do something it's not supposed to do and cause a critical error yeah this has been done in the laboratory this has actually been done in the laboratory where they've actually been able to hack quote unhackable chips by going well let's attack this on a hardware level let's yeah. just create something that on paper you wouldn't think that this could you know be like there's no problem but once you realize wait those those rows are really close together and it's just and that's just the one approach. Well, and so that's you and that's and that's one of those things that uh, uh, you know is always so fascinating about guys uh, who educate and talk about and communicate on this, like Darren Kitchen. When you talk about hacking, a I think that we are we are entering a point now, and this is something that's been a great uh, uh, pet peeve of mine in terms of reporting about stuff like this, that we just lump everything into hacking, right? Yeah. And and, and, and I think that does a tremendous disservice uh, to readers and listeners and viewers when we say when we, we use terms that are very broad, like hacking uh, to to encompass everything to say. Yeah, and I'll use political metaphors because that's what everybody is is, is uh, aware of now. But spear phishing, which is something that happened with, you know, emails from the Democratic National Committee and John Podesta is far different than. 
infecting a voting machine or something like that or, or yeah. affecting stuff like that. And you use the same term for it and it doesn't really make sense. But if we are to use that broad term correctly, and this is something that Darren Kitchen talks often about, is it, it brings a lot more clarity as to what hacking the broad idea is, which is just taking advantage of soft spots in a system, be mm-hmm. it talking to somebody, be it in the mail, be it in email, be it in hardware. If you can determine where the system has, the system can break down, where you can penetrate that system, that is the idea of hacking. And it, it necessitates as 360 of a worldview as possible because you've exactly hit it uh, hit the nail on the head with with uh, with with that example if the software is indeed impenetrable then think about the hardware how mm-hmm. do you get access to somebody's email because somebody has to answer the email and they might give you the password like that's that is uh, uh, the the larger kind of concept of it and i i wish that we talked more when we refer to hacking, we would talk about it more in that sense and less in the very specific, narrow sense of somebody got spearfished, somebody compromised a voting machine, stuff like that. You know, uh, I'm going to give a, another example is uh, if you use Gmail on your phone, yeah. if you looked at that responses on the bottom, if I sent you a Gmail right now that says, do you want to go to lunch? Yeah. You know what appears below? Uh, the little autofill yes or no kind of thing or yeah and those are and that's actually ray kurzweil is works on the program that developed that ray kurzweil is a big you know artificial intelligence pioneer guy who said some very amazing you know predictions we'll see if they come true on where we're going to be and he may be a little bit off but some stuff is very poignant uh and so what they've developed is a system that contextually looks at what your email is and says okay what is the likely response that you want to this? And often it's it's gotten beyond just yes or no, or it can be like, yeah, send it to me. Or yeah. this is great. It knows it's talking about a thing. So this is a very simple set of AI, but it's an AI that is trying to determine the context of something being sent to you and to respond. And so if we want to develop you know, a, a malicious AI that could use spear phishing, whatever, it can learn very quickly. It can send a you know, it can send a thousand emails to people and say you know what what gets the most the best response back, then adapt and change and then it, it's it's we're watching that right now between you know Alexa, Siri, Google Voice, etc. But looking just in your little email box, you can see that you have a system there that's trying desperately to understand what the conversation is about. This is where it is now. Yeah, and that's and that's the thing is is it's trying to figure out what happens when it does and yeah. and uh, uh we are at a level now where it is retail distributed this isn't just stuff happening in labs right and that's and that's the biggest thing what happened between the years of when you know a uh, uh, darpanet and and you know AOL and the open internet and 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 stuff like that you know when when everybody gets their hands on it oh boy well, and that's the that's the fear is the idea of the bad actor. It's one thing when we talk about like, hey, if we develop the really cool AI that's going to help us, that's great. But before then, you can get these semi useful AI that do one thing really well yeah. in the hands of bad actors. And there are people out there that will do that. And that's that's the scary situation is, is what happens with, you know, the person doing the malevolent thing with it. Uh, Tim back in the chat says, as I mentioned earlier, I think that by the time we get to an AI that could be scary. It will stop caring about us and move on. I I I don't agree with that. I think Stuxnet's scary to me, and it's barely even an AI. Stuxnet got outside of what I think. I understand why we did it, but it started infecting other systems. It's already these things are you know we have worms and viruses that are out there causing problems, and you have you know you look at these things that are you know when you get your computer infected and you find your files have been encrypted because it's actually just a piece of software that arguably is borderline AI that's doing it. It's already a threat. It's already a threat. Things are going in there looking for vulnerable systems, looking for exploits and doing that. Um, too late, man. It's already happening. So mm-hmm. I don't think, I think people tend to think of the super smart mustache twirling AI. Yeah. I'm talking about smarter viruses, smarter worms that somebody says. Just big, you know, what big is, dumb bully AI. 
yeah, you know, the one that just, you know, decides that you're already having, you know, ransomware. You know, ransomware is already scary and uses elements of AI to learn how to adapt and evolve. It's not getting less scary. It's getting more scary to me, you know. So that's my take on it. You know, the, not talking, I'm not talking Skynet, you no. know. I, I'm, I'm talking, you know, ransomware times a thousand. Uh, well, on that cheery note, let's go ahead and uh, move on to picks. We're, we're going to skip Journey Quest this week uh, uh, because we want to wait for Bri Bri. But uh, picks, do you got uh, you got something that you want to shout out? Aside, of course, from The Naturalist, the number one book on Amazon, which you can go right now if you are a Prime member. You can get that Kindle copy for free uh, because it is a Kindle first all this month. So go ahead and check that out. That is The Naturalist. By Andrew Maine, number one book on Amazon, folks. This is not a drill. Weird things put a a, a number one book on Amazon. Uh, we're going to talk a lot more about that in, in After Things. So, of course, that is everybody's pick. But, Andrew, do you have anything else? Uh, my, uh, you know, gosh. Um, still enjoying Rick and Morty. You know, Game of Thrones is is vanished, uh, and so left with what do I do? How do I entertain myself? And you know, I'm just waiting for more Rick and Morty. Can I just say this? And my pick's going to be Rick and Morty as well because I don't want to shout out the book that I'm reading right now because it's political and it'll just be a political thing. So, uh, but I am I am reading uh, Devil's Bargain uh, about Steve Bannon and Donald Trump, and I have thoughts. That's going to be our new book club pick on PX3. So if you're into that, listen to Politics, Politics, Politics. But uh, I'm going to double down on Rick and Morty. And I want to tell you this. Andrew, uh, uh, I've been going to Dragon Con for, geez, now, probably seven years, seven or eight years, something like that. And and the one thing that I always like to track is who the winners and losers on cosplay are. I find that to be my kind of like geek barometer on like what's resonating with a certain element, a, a very passionate and influential element of geek culture. And far before Deadpool lit it up at the box office, Deadpool was the costume at Dragon Con, year after year after year. People loved Deadpool. They loved doing the mashups of the Deadpools. They loved dancing around. It was always a fun, there was a Deadpool culture that was very excited when they did a movie that they found good, right? I will say this, Rick and Morty was the biggest gain I have ever seen year on year at a Dragon Con. It was explosive. Rick, The Rick Sanchez costume was the new Deadpool. So many Rick Sanchez uh, says, uh, Rick Sanchez is running around. And extraordinary costumes that were from episodes that aired... Like weeks before, like the 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 the, the here, uh, 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 it was it was it was remarkable. Uh, talk, talk about Rick and Morty so I can find pictures of this. So you had as yeah the with the photos coming out like the Vindicators episode, which just came out a little while ago. Now we had a peek at the Pickle Rick before, so you could know Pickle Rick was coming. But Vindicators, and you know fans pay attention and look for clues of what's coming out there and doing that. But you have people who. That entire culture of of you know cosplay culture of trying to do this and celebrate that is absolutely amazing. If you've not watched this show, I recommend it. I'm not a guy that goes on and on about cartoons. I love Rick and Morty because if you love sci-fi, but you're at that point where you can see a plot a mile away, you know Rick and Morty surprises you and delights you because it's not about that. Here we got we've got Pickle Rick and uh, Morty. Uh, from uh that was like episode three or something like that uh um, yeah yeah no uh, uh that was from from i think the second episode where yeah. where his his arm gets uh uh haunted by an old uh warrior just his arm uh gets yeah. uh gets in, uh, haunted by an old warrior just incredible cosplay like yeah the vindicators one is fantastic yeah let me know. let me go ahead and try to find this uh uh a vindicators cosplay but I will say this. So I was talking about this at the uh, uh, one of the bars in Dragon yesterday. And I'm talking like, man, oh, my God, Rick and Morty just over the top. 
Uh, and I'm like, yeah, the, the, apparently the Vindicators were, were out there yesterday. I didn't get a chance to see it. The guy next to me, he goes like, yeah, uh, uh, I, I was Ghost Train. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, they were they were only down uh, uh, you know, millions of ants or a million of ants and and crocubot. Go look at the official Rick and Morty Twitter. There are links to that. Okay. On there. Uh, uh, yeah, they have a very funny joke as why uh, million million ants wasn't there. Uh, <laughs> why million ants and and uh, cyber or croc crocborg or cyber croc wasn't there. Crocubot. Crocubot. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, here we go. It's a very funny Rick and Morty response to that. This is, this is, again, and this is not just like, you know, uh, a Halloween cosplay. This is pro costume, uh, you know, uh, this is what you would see at a, at a theme park, right? Like, yeah. uh, which is just amazing. A, it speaks to kind of how, uh, uh, you know how far Dragon Con has come in terms of showcasing that community, but at the same time, I really do think that there's just something to that show that has captured the 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 zeitgeist. And I do think part of it is, I think for me and you, we love it because it is it is a writer's show, right? It's it's a show yeah. that wants to make sure you do not know where it is going. And 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 thinks around the corners, so so you are always kind of surprised by it. There's uh, check the feed because there's check the, the the caption they gave to that photo, which is really hilarious. Oh, this is a uh, 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 here we go. Let's get the, uh, uh, the 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 feed. It's a little foul, but it's really funny though. Yeah, <laughs> well, in in true Rick and Morty fashion, sure, maybe a little a little crass. Here we go. This is uh, again the official Rick and Morty page. Quick, let's get a group shot while millions of uh, while million of ants and Croggy Bot are taking one million and a half uh, uh, s words. <laughs> <laughs> and that's funny. And then they have an official response when uh, Elon Musk was asked if he liked Rick and Morty. Uh huh. And he and he goes, uh, "You got to find it," because he said, "Like, yeah, we find it kind of my boys and I. It's kind of disgusting, but my boys and I love it." Uh, and then the, the official Rick and Morty response. So here you have this irreverent cartoon show responding to, a, you know, a billionaire with about $20 billion leading the frontier of space flight, electric cars, whatever, an absolute pioneer who's talking about this show and their response to him. This yeah. is the world we live in, folks. Oh, my word. My word. So crazy, man. Uh, you find the response? I have not found it. I'm trying to uh, trying to find it here now. If somebody else has it in the uh, in the chat, I can. Uh... Oh, wait, is this it? No, it's the Vindicators one. Uh, yeah, if somebody else has it in the chat, then we will then we will uh, 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 throw it up there. Most of uh, the Rick and Morty Twitter is um, <laughs> Justin Roiland yelling at bootleg <laughs> uh, t-shirts. Uh. There is. Uh, uh, anyway. That's an amazing fan art there, too. Just amazing fan Yeah, art. Rick and Morty, uh, no new episode this week, but new episode next week. Uh, just great work. Great work. And listen, this was a season that was delayed for a long time because they they wanted to make sure that, you know, in Dan Harmon's words, that the writing was something that they were proud of to follow up that second season that, that by and large, everybody liked. So, uh, so far, so good. If that... Is so the case. I'll, I'll 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 paraphrase, and it was uh, we look forward. Just wait, we look forward to discussing the rest of the Musk family. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Amazing, amazing work, amazing yeah. work. Okay, well, uh, I feel like that's gonna wrap it up. Uh, Andrew, any final uh, any final words? Uh, I've got no more words. Thank you so much for everybody that supported. The Naturalist, I uh, could not be more excited about the response I've been getting. I'm over the moon. Um, to have it, you know, even debut in the top 10 was phenomenal. And we'll get into this in after things and talk a little bit more about that. So, but anyhow, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If all you do listen to is this podcast, check out, you can pre-order it now uh, too. So October 1st is when it officially drops. Get that free copy if you're a Prime member. And That's also if you're a Prime member, consider giving your Twitch subscription to us. 
at uh, twitch.tv slash night attack, which is where we air this show live, usually Mondays, but today and Tuesday at uh, 1130 Pacific. That is, uh, what is that, East Coast? 2.30? 2.30 East Coast. Yeah. Any hoot. Go ahead and uh, uh, check us out, twitch.tv slash night attack. Until next time. It's been weird. All right, I'm going to run my AC for a little bit, and then we'll do after things, and we'll see if Bry's around. Does that sound cool? You got it. Leave this running. It's open. The channel is open. All right, ladies and germs. What do we uh, What do we say? What do we know? What do we like for the uh, What do we like for the titles? Yep, bit of a boo, bit of a bit of a boo. Show my list, but aliens, but Brookings, alien wiretap. Do my thing here, sorry. Uh, why can't we gleep glops? <laughs> Friends with strangers, Shamerica and Schmizreal, I hackworm, gaping holes in your air gap, hacker elite, worse than Ultron. I really like but aliens. But aliens. That's uh I'll go ahead and bring me back to full screen. Gamer chick, what's going on today? Well, uh, uh we just did weird things. We will be doing uh after things after that. Uh jury is already live in audio form for everybody, and thanks to a uh a very patient uh, 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 an infirmed Bryce Castillo. Uh, I'm I'm gonna be doing two recordings, so uh, and I I have not video recorded, so I don't know if we're posting it video wise anywhere. But uh, I, I'll have two two wave files, one for the podcast and one for uh, for after things. Unless I should just start recording now. And that would be after show slash after things. Uh, yeah, Bryce got the con crud. Yeah, we don't do video officially. Cool. Um, so yeah, Bryce uh, uh, got that uh, a video to me. So I'll be reposting that to YouTube. So you'll be able to see the video of OPP, which I thought went really well. And then I go to the physical therapist. Woot, woot. Uh, gamer chick, awesome. Sounds great. How are you doing, sir? Pretty good. You know, um, Dragon Con, always a blast. But this year, you know, 5% of a bummer just because the back kind of kept me from, you know, doing the full experience. Uh... You know, it was uh, it was a little hard, a little hard to kind of um, not have the mobility and uh, uh, just not be able to bop around from one thing to another, back and forth, back and forth in the way that we did. But, you know, uh, uh, still amazing. Shows went great. I thought Night Attack was probably the best Night Attack at Dragon Con we've had in, I'd say, three years, you know been uh been been pretty good pretty good uh there we go the man andrew main is back hello i'm andrew main i'm a man uh you know i'll tell you what i gotta be out of here for a 2 30 uh appointment so i probably wind up leaving around 2 15 at the latest do you want to just start after things and we'll just text brian and see if yeah he can he can jump in yeah, let me. Uh, I'll text Brian right now. You get everything ready to roll. And... Okay, cool. Yeah, we are we are ready to go. Just uh, I didn't want to um, if we'd like text and then. No, no, we should just get we... going, and yeah. if he can do it, you can join us. It's yeah. totally cool. Uh, uh, uh. Mm. Uh, what was the just a second count? Oh. 
uh, gamer chick. I've never heard of Dragon Con before. Dragon Con is a is a real fun time, gamer chick. Uh, you should check it out specifically if you're in the southeast or somewhere where you can drive to Atlanta. It is uh, a con that this year uh, ballooned up to eighty thousand people that take over downtown Atlanta. Just to give you a sense of how gigantic it is, it it engulfs a huge weekend for college football that kicks off every year just a few blocks down the road at uh, what was used to be the Georgia Dome, and this year was the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, the new uh, the new stadium. But actually, let me check this out. Um, we're ready. I'm ready to go whenever you... I don't mean to interrupt, but if okay. you want to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just... Real, we'll start after this. Uh, let's see the capacity. So the capacity of the stadium is 71,000 for football, expandable to 83,000. That is about what is there as a standing army <laughs> for three days, effectively. Uh, all geeks of all stripes at Dragon Con. So it is a fun time. Okay, here we go. Uh, are you ready to roll, Andrew? Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, tweeting something out about a book I wrote. Just, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I am ready to go. All right, here we go. In three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Maine and I am joined by Justin Robert Young and Brian Brushwood. By the way, we can call him on a Skype if we want to get Brian on board. Uh, excellent, excellent. Well, uh, I will do that. But first, let's go ahead and set up the premise of this uh, this year program, which is that uh, uh, you have a, a huge uh a, a, a huge momentous success on your hand um i mean all things being relative uh yeah. very 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 stoked right now so as you all know and i think most of you came over from weird things you know that my book the naturalist is out or is going to be officially out october 1st it's in its pre-release phase right now available now for amazon prime members and pre-order came out friday friday morning Friday morning, I woke up and saw that uh, it was had been selected as a Kindle first, which is where the Amazon editors select books they want to showcase. And so they selected me. They and that was really really awesome. They have many books to choose from. They get released every every month, but they decided to go with my book as one of them as a thriller mystery selection. So the book I don't know where it started, but by the time I saw it, early Friday morning, it was number eight on all of books and ebooks on Amazon, which being in the top 10, launching in the top 10, uh, I, over the moon, excited, thrilled, whatever, what have you. And then later in the day, it climbed to number three. Okay. And you don't want to be in a position where you're like wanting something that's going to make you disappointed. But I was kind of hoping for, you know, I started to care a little bit, a little emotionally overcome right now as I uh, wipe myself down with my McDonald's napkin. It climbed to number two, and once it got to number two, it's like, ooh, ooh, do 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 I dare want it to get to you know? And like, don't even hope for it because you just be happy, just be happy you're in the top 100, let alone the top 10. Well, I woke up Saturday morning, and the Naturalist hit number one, and uh, hit number one on Amazon. And that's all books, and that was just a thrilling, thrilling moment as an author. And it's updated hourly, but it stayed there all day. It stayed all day at number one. Um, and I did, I man, I'm, you know, I pushed and pushed as much as I could on Periscope, Twitter, you know, email list, telling everybody, get the book. If you like the book, review the book, whatever. Just 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 check the book out. That's all I ask for. Yeah. You know, let, let you decide what you know what you think of it. All day at number one, which is kind of awesome. And this is for, you know. All books, which is kind of awesome. So that was Saturday. Then Sunday, it you know, I kept checking, you know, not that I didn't want to check, kept checking, kept checking. It stayed there all day. Sunday it was two days. Two days at number one was really cool. And it started, you know, it had uh it had actually started late Friday, whatever, or partially. So I had actually three days, partially Monday. So I had three days where I hit, and then it went to number two yesterday. And I was okay with that because as author ranks go, J.K. Rowling was like number four, number five. And I'm sure she was coping with that. Sure. I'm sure she was managing that. And Stephen King, I'm sure they were on the phone like, ah, can you believe this guy, right? Yeah. Uh, but in all seriousness, you're like, 
you know what? Like all I cared for was breaking into the top hundred. Yeah. And hit number one was awesome. And then, uh, you know, talked to my agent today, all that sort of stuff. And then we hopped on to go do weird things. And right before today, we did a little refresh to see what the bestseller rank was. And, uh, and Andrew, what was it? Naturalist was back to number one. Back to number one after a very brief sojourn outside to uh, to the, the, the debilitating number two slot. Uh, <laughs> uh, now uh, back to number one. Uh, Brian, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, adjusting the, the thing here to bring you up on video, but uh, you are you are clear on audio. Uh, what was your experience watching Andrew through this? Dude, uh, my experience was a couple of, you know, texts back and forth with Andrew, but then the rest of my time just constantly hitting refresh all day, specifically watching the reviews come in, because I guess there's a whole there's a whole group of people that whatever comes out on the Kindle store, they jump in and they gobble up books. People were buying it that morning and posting reviews on it that night, uh, which was great in that they tended to be largely five star reviews. Uh, but it was the one star reviews that were killing me because they were for the dumbest reasons. Like I couldn't get this to download correctly. One star. Uh, and, and the one that broke my heart the most was a fast paced action packed read. What a fun book. One star. It's like <laughs> you screwed up. Very, that's the Michelin guide approach towards it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, we've talked a bit before about how you deal with reviews, and one of the things, and Brian and I had kind of a long long conversation about this on Saturday. When you put something out for your fans and people who know you, you're going to get warm hugs. You're, you're, you're going to get embraced. You're going to get love. And it's not necessarily realistic to how the rest of the world is going to like something. You know, if we do something, people are going to be like, five stars, we love it, because you did this thing. You did what I liked before, and I'm reading this, and I like this because I like you. What happens is, is you then get another wave of people who don't have that experience. All you are is a book. All you are is a book, and, and they will judge it purely on those grounds, which that's really the comfortable place you want to be in is where somebody who doesn't know me or understand it will judge the work entirely by itself. And those reviews started coming in, and that was enthusiastic because these were top 500 Amazon reviewers, no effing idea who I was, and they were picking up what I was about. Then there's the third wave which is people reacting to the hype. Once a book makes it to number one, once people start raving about something, you get then people who are not reacting to the book, they're reacting to the response to the book. And that's why I said, you know, for a book that goes super popular or super mainstream, being in the number four or high three territory is not a bad place to be no. because you're being pushed in front of so many other people that just won a book and they but they may not be into thriller mystery they may not be into science they may not be in you know andrew main style writing and so i told myself like i know where i want to be but i know where i'm comfortable being and we'll see the book if this book's momentum keeps going we're gonna see it's gonna be all over the place but i'm, I'm happy that the first sort of people just reacting to the book has been very positive uh and of course here after things is where we commit to giving you guys the real work here and and the reason why this thing shot up like a rocket is because of your involvement in the kill in the kindle first program right that's 100 percent. how does that how does that come together so kindle first is a program where the editors it's in, in a section of amazon they will select books that they want to feature for the month that for the month they select books and it's, I think it's open to just, I, I'm not sure which publishers are open to it or which publishers are involved in it. I don't know that part, but a publisher says, okay, here's the deal. We'll let you, you know, effectively give the book away to Amazon prime members so they can review it before anybody else. It's a pre-release way to go out there. And, you know, it, the book is basically, it counts as a paid book, counts as a paid, you know, as an actual download because I am, I'm given a compensation for that, not a per book, but basically a buyout, whatever kind of thing they do that. So the goal is there. It's a way to provide a perk for Amazon Prime members. It's a way to say, hey, here's a special way to be a member of Amazon Prime. You get this book in advance. So they select and they have, you know, hundreds of books to select from. I don't know the number of it, but they choose what they think are going to best fit. They want to give a wide range. They choose like, you know, you know, fictional, historical, et cetera. And so that's what the Kindle First program is. And you have to submit a book way, way in advance. So I know that when my book was first picked up, Thomas and Mercer, they had submitted it. They said, we want to put you in as a Kindle first. 
They don't submit every book that they pick up to do this. They, they're careful about what they choose to do it. And then I found out a couple months ago that I, I had won or I, you know, I got that slot. Yeah. And and we talked about a little bit of Atlas and I was vague about stuff because I knew my goal is to get my books read by as many people as possible. And being able to have a book in the Kindle First program was wonderful because I just want to build up reviews. I want to build fans. You know, if people then buy the books and all that, that's wonderful. But I'm I still want to spread as you know an artist and getting you know people reading my stuff. So being selected for that was great. It was super helpful. It got to my core philosophy, which is, you know, I use my email list. When I own a book, all the rights to it, I will give copies away for free just to get people to read it. If you look at a book like Station Breaker, I was giving away ebook versions of that to people on my email list. I'm like, just read it. You know, you don't have to review it. You're not obligated to anything. I want real reviews. And we've talked about this before. You know, I had, you know, one of the first critical responses I got was somebody who saw a lot of the positive response is like, ah, this smells fishy to me. And I responded, I'm like, listen, like, it hurts me as a writer and trying to build my fan base if I get bogus reviews, because I want people to read a review and know what the book's about. Because if you read this review and it's like, that's the most awesome book ever, and you get it and you're unhappy, your review is going to you know, all the reviews, all the negative reviews that come after that review are going to bring me down. Yeah. So. yeah. so were you were you able to still determine your own publishing date or was there like a batch or a time? Uh, was it you and a group of other people or I guess just they're constantly adding people to the program? There was it was the you know, they 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 say when the book is going to be released, they pitch it to the editors at Amazon again. And Amazon has a number of programs that they do for choosing. They have many different ways of featuring books and. So this was decided well in advance. I turned in the manuscript for this, you know, December last year, you know, um, I bet probably I did some revisions on that, but that was when like, I think the, the, the major part of the manuscript was done, but that it was, I was told probably a year ago, they were going to submit it for, for this you know, program 10 months ago. Yeah. Yeah. That they, they were going to try to submit it to see if they couldn't get me into the slot. Now you only know what you are told in this prog in this process, but like you mentioned for, for the people that, are are published by your your you know thomas and mercer not everybody goes into this program how much do you think no and it's not just thomas and mercer it's a bunch of the other companies and I, i'm not sure i don't know it may be open to other publishers too outside of amazon publishing too okay. i don't know the answer on that but yeah it's it's lots of others like union others etc so so how much do you think in 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 the kindle first programs understanding of this the fact that you were a successful uh, uh, author in their platform. You made your name because of eBooks that you uh, uh, built a fan base for and, and wound up being successful in their algorithm with Angel Killer. Yeah, I think even going back to Public Enemy Zero, you know, the yeah. first, you know, uh, and, you know, we had the first book I ever released was The Grendel's Shadow. And, and that was like my first experience, like, oh, I climbed to the top of like Steampunk, you know, for a while. Yeah. And then understanding that, and it's not, some people kind of think like, oh, I mean, I, I don't look well in this conversation, but it's funny and relevant. You know, I went to the Magic Castle the other day and I was talking about books or something like this. And and and, and I may have mentioned, oh, yeah, I've got the I got the you know, I, got the, I have the number one book on Amazon right now. Yeah. And I got this. Well, you know, you can really game those categories that go in what category? <laughs> oh, yeah. you got to be that smug. I, I, oh, my God. oh wait, no, it's a little category. Oh wait, what is it? I don't know if you heard. It. Uh, yeah, it's it's books. Books. <laughs> <laughs> Phone comes out. Dit, 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 dit. Oh wow! This little, this little, this little, this little category. Sure maybe, maybe you've heard of it. It's it's called books. Oh, wait, I screwed that up. <laughs> it's, it's just, um, I'm not proud of my behavior in that moment or the smugness in which I felt, but that was absolutely because it was because I said that too. Because people are like, oh, my friend had a number one. I'm like, well, what? Because, like, you know, you know, there's ways to game categories for an hour or whatever, but sure. Well, and uh, uh, and specifically also, magicians are the 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 kind of bunch that has a well earned reputation. But the magicians tend to have a uh, crab in the bucket syndrome, where the moment somebody looks like they're about to climb out of the bucket, they gotta drag them down. And uh, what a great moment for somebody to, to say that to you and be able to. <laughs> the, the best was. Like, I wish I recorded this because I called my mom. I told her like, "Hey, I hit number one." You know, it's like great, 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 great. 
Then I called my dad a little while later who was watching football at a friend's house. I'm like, oh, did you hear the news about the books? Like, yeah. Uh, Mom says you hit number one in science fiction. Oh, no. <laughs> I go, Dad, uh, I got to call you right back. I got to call you right back. <laughs> I call my mom. I'm like, um, so I talked to Dad. <laughs> and uh, uh, what did you tell him? I told him you were number one. Did, did you say? I think I said science fiction. I go, Mom. Yeah, I'm number one in science fiction and thriller mystery. And you know what else I'm number one in? All of books, Mom. You're fired. <laughs> Let me just say. Uh, so, yeah. It the, the, uh, uh, there, there, there's, that, that is yet another rich uh, 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 addition to the ever-growing compendium of the, 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 the Pat and Andy show, uh, uh, Andrew's relationship with his mother. Yeah, I went zero to awful pretty quickly, folks. Pretty quickly. <laughs> Not going to lie here. Um, in all seriousness, it's a fun thing. You just try to enjoy it while you can. Because, I mean, and in, in the middle of all this, I'm in Burbank. The hills are on fire. We've got amazing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm Saturday. I'm feeling great. And I walk into this Zanku chicken place. And in front of me are four firemen covered in ash, you know, who just got down from fighting the fire, you know. And you're like, yeah, no, what they did, that really matters. You know, my brother, my brother's sending me photos of him on a boat where he's helping with rescue efforts in the middle of Houston, you know, and, you know, I have friends that are helping rebuild houses, you know, and I so you're like, story. look at me, I'm a writer guy. <laughs> but, uh, but as far as, I mean, certainly for the audience that listens to After Things, I mean, this is, uh, uh, this is, I, I don't want to say harvest time because that makes it sound like it's the end of the road, but. Um, I'll tell you what really strikes me. How long ago did you write uh, The Grendel Shadow? Six years ago. March. Six years ago. South by Southwest. You started uh, <clears throat> publishing this stuff because there was a new platform. And at the time, uh, it, it, it is strange to watch a friend of yours that you know for being a magician, for creating illusions. And, oh, yeah, he writes illusion books. And, uh, oh, you know, somebody's got pretensions of whatever. Um, uh, not, not that I felt that way. But I can understand how somebody would feel that way. At this point now, six years down the road, how many books have you written and how many are published? I've probably written close to 30 uh, through publisher publishing, either an audio or, I mean, like, uh, there have been three Jessica Blackwood books. The Naturalist is the fourth print book that's come out, not including foreign editions. Uh, then we have the Tantra audio versions of Station Breaker and orbital and then you know we can count like word fire press did a, a run with uh chronological man for things so chronological monsters and, this, and so. then on top of those uh, all the rest of the books are all they're all in the amazon store here here's my point um when you go back to that moment that you sat down to write your first novella you know the uh the grendel shadow uh it may have seemed outrageous and insane to sit there having never written a, a, a fiction book or, that got published uh, to self-publish and say, I'm going to be a number one bestseller for a week straight, basically. You know, we're creeping up on that. A week straight uh, in the Amazon store. Um, that seems so audacious that many people are going to think the journey from here to there is too far. Like, there's no way I can become that it's six whole years in the future uh and this is my my favorite quote from brian tracy he says the time is going to pass anyway it will become six years from now one way or the other and you will have either written 30 books in the meantime yeah. or still be talking about how you're getting ready to get started you know it, it, it's absolutely, absolutely true. And and I get on my friends' cases because I kind of stop having conversations with people because after a point, they're either going to do it or not. Yeah. You know, I, I, I have a friend and I'm not going to name names. So I kept saying, you need to start an online store to, to you, know, cap, you know, capitalize on your internet presence, et cetera. You should do this. You should do this. You should do this. And then they did it. Brian Brush. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I was about to say this sounds familiar. It sounds yeah. really yeah. familiar. Uh, but but you you and you have friends that get things done. You have friends that get things done or friends that talk about things. And not everybody's gonna do it right when you say because they have you had to evaluate and do things. And then you did it in a great way. The way you did it was different than I would have thought to do it. The way you launched it was brilliant because you put a lot of time into it, whatever. But you you can say, I mean, you realize at some point, like, yeah, this this is not a thing a guy should do, this is a thing I should do now. 
for me in writing, the, 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 the scare factor was I'd never written a novel before. I tried, I kept failing at 35,000 words. And then I said, you know what? 35,000 words is a perfectly sized novella. So if I, if I stop at 35,000 words, but I'm writing a novella, then it's done. And that's what The Grindel Shadow was, was the first test run to see, could I make it to the end of a novella? After The Grindel Shadow flew right by, I'm like, now it's time to write a novel. And I was scared because I knew I didn't, I know there was so much I didn't know. I'm like, I don't know so much about writing. I'm, I was at the point where I could take a book apart on an objective level and say what is, where it succeeded or failed for me. So, you know, I made this promise that after every, every book I wrote, I would read a book on writing. I would do something to improve my writing craft. So I wasn't just like, look at me, I am a writer and I know what I'm doing. I'm like, no, I'm constantly trying to get better. And I had a wonderful, wonderful run because the next book was Public Enemy Zero, which was like a top techno thriller. And that was a book that I wrote literally weeks after finishing Grindel's Shadow. I think that came out in April or May or whatever. Like, and that book, you know, did, I think that may have made it into the top 100 or 500 or something on Amazon. It was, it topped in sci-fi for a while. And that was the book that I'm like, and it sold really well. And I'm like, you know what? This is my hit. This is my hit. Enjoy this. If I can come close to this with other books, I'll have a good writing career. And, you know, I wrote a couple of the little things. Uh, also, also, wait, hey, let me, let me, let me put a pause on this while, while Andrew goes through this. Cause by the way, this is all happening at the same time that, you know, we're still doing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm still in Florida. Uh, uh, Itrix is still going. The store is still going. Andrew's still creating uh, DVDs and, and magic books and effects and everything. Uh, uh, the, the pitch uh, for a television show, the march toward a television show continued in, in the fits and starts that, that went along with, with that, that uh, this was its own process that kind of kept incrementally sort of humming along. Yeah, I was other things were going on, but I, I started doing books because I wanted to have something that was on its own, that I wasn't waiting for a studio executive or somebody else to say, yes, you you get to have a TV show or whatever. So Public Enemy Zero did really well. And, and my advice to some people who are thinking about self-publishing is that that's how I got my agent. I got my first t movie deal from that book and, so, and a book that's still self-published this day. It's never been picked up in print or audio by anybody else. Uh, which I think is kind of crazy because I think it would do really that's well nuts. by that. But I know, God, I know. Public Enemy Zero is so good. It's it, that's uh, if anything, I would say uh, uh, that that's that's a, a, a book that should be picked up and had a, a sequel written for it. Like it, it's great. Well, well but it's that's one of those things too where it's like uh, the nice thing about owning all your stuff and uh, and being a writer is that your back catalog will only get more valuable after uh, after your first number one bestseller. Yeah, I mean, think about. Think about um, uh, how many of Michael Crichton's book exploded after uh, Jurassic Park uh, did so? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he, I mean, yeah, he's, man, he's my idol. Uh, but I wrote that, and I'm like, Public Enemies are like, all right, this is my big hit, maybe. And I and I knew that, I, I read somewhere that like one out of nine books from publishers actually makes money for the others. And I said, okay, I don't want, I can't write a book a year and wait nine years for success. I should be thinking about writing maybe nine books a year or something and not garbage. You know, and I have I have books that just will never see the light of day. I'm sure people would like them, but I'm like, nah, I want to I, I need I learned this. I learned this. I learned that. But I said, I'm going to have a crazy pace. So that first year I wrote Grendel Shadow, Public Enemy Zero, Chronological Man, Monster in the Mist. Uh, I put out at least like four books in that first year. And then I wrote a little thing called Angel Killer, which came out, I think, March the next year, which is a year from when I decided I was going to be a novelist. I put out my fifth or my sixth book, which was Angel Killer. And that had an interesting path. Initially, it did really well with our audience, and then it slowed down, and then I moved on to Hollywood Pharaohs or whatever. But at that point, I was getting meetings for Public Enemy Zero, et cetera. And then, what uh, was, it, was, it, was it Public Enemy Zero where, where you first started – you first started getting the agent and the yeah. And, and, Public Enemy Zero got me my agent. Yeah, Public Enemy so, Zero, and 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 that was also the first uh, check for for movie rights, right? Yep, yep. That was the first check for movie rights. That was what I, you know, I I, I went with uh, Trident Media, Robert Gottlieb, and Erica Silverman, who were uh, wonderful, fantastic, and and that introduced me to the whole world. It was a year, you know, you know, within within almost a year of having written Public Enemy Zero. Uh, 
I then put out Angel Killer, or put an Angel Killer a year later, and I thought Public Enemy Zero, that was going to be the top book, right? And then Angel Killer comes out, and during that summer, we were at Dragon Con. Yep. And, and, and I'm in the middle of negotiating, by the way, when that book starts to take off, all of a sudden there's an interest in an Andrew Main TV show and whatnot. And I think I kicked you awake to tell you that, like, the, the results for Angel Killer, how that no, was I doing. Rem- I remember it like it was yesterday because I was just literally at that same spot. We were at the the Pulse Bar, the Pulse Loft in, in the Marriott, if you've ever been to, to Dragon Con. And we were looking out into the sea of humanity. And Andrew's like, hey, have you seen the the... The, the like what's what Angel Killer's doing, and I'm like, no, nah, I, I haven't seen it. And he pulls out his phone, and he shows me that it's just it's it's you know it's charting in these like crazy places that we had never seen it chart before, and uh, uh, we wound up tracking it back to to uh, uh, England, British. It was England. British. Was, most yeah. of the sales are coming in England, uh, and, and it, crazy. And it was just it yeah. was just overnight. So that book, you know, and that was, and that eclipsed Public Enemy Zero. And that was, and that was, and the funny thing about that is I was on the phone with my agent talking about the film rights for Public Enemy Zero. And she says to me, she says, what's this book, Angel Killer? <laughs> and I go, oh, you know, like, you know, I still, you know, self-publish. She's like, yeah. She goes, yeah, I had some people who are working on the rights for Public Enemy Zero. They're asking me about Angel Killer. I'm like, yeah. And this is before it had blown up. And I'm yeah. like, you know, yeah, it's been doing good. She's, I love Erica. She goes, maybe you should send it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and of course you're being totally self-deprecating like oh i don't know i'm just uh the first or second year self-published author working on it yeah and it was literally that was a book i sat down though and i said i want to try to write a mainstream thriller i i, I you know i want to do a topic i like i want to do that venn diagram of things i love and things i think would be popular and so that was i was very very unsure of it and that i it it you know, I remember it was something like in October or whatever or somewhere I got an email that said congratulations from another agent. Didn't know if I was picked up yet. And I'm like, what for? And he said, oh, Amazon UK released a list of the top 10 best selling authors in the United in the United Kingdom, indie, indie authors. And I was number five. Wow. And you're like, holy cow. And I think like if there had been an American list, because that book sold hundreds of thousands of copies, if there had been an American list, I may have been in the top 10 or something like that, too. So that was this. And it was like, wow, you know, I thought Public Enemy Zero was the top and then Angel Killer. And then we made a deal with Harper Collins, do a two book deal. And then a big important thing happened is I worked with a wonderful editor there, Hannah Wood, who was old school, young woman, but old school was like like my English teacher, you know, would red pen my manuscripts. And I learned so much from her about how to improve. And my writing style, I think, really improved in a, at a very fast rate because I was very dedicated towards doing that. And I had great feedback. I had absolutely great feedback. And I knew I had to grow. I knew I wanted to grow. So that first book that I did with Harper Collins, which after Angel Killer, we did a version of that, Name of the Devil, that put me on the Thriller Award shortlist. I was a finalist for the Thriller Award. And I started to feel like, OK, I think I'm getting industry recognition now. And the books are moving. So that was a good point. But even with the Angel Killer, you're like, okay, that's it. You know, Name of the Devil didn't do anywhere near as Angel Killer did. But Name of the Devil got recognition. And you're kind of like, okay, I guess this is it. You know, now I just got to figure out how to come close to what I did before. Uh, by the way, I'm just, uh, I just wanted to look at Angel Killer real quick. Uh, Angel Killer, number one in mystery or thrillers and suspense. Number one in mystery. Uh, number one. Naturalist, in- you mean? No, Angel Killer right now, uh, uh, also in, in books, in uh, uh, mystery, thriller, and suspense, in the thriller and suspense category. Oh, no, no, sorry. No, 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 no. No, I, I, uh, my mistake, my mistake. This is your author rank that I'm looking at. Yeah, you have author rank, yeah. the number one and all that. And also that you are, when you look at the top 100 authors, the top two are Andrew May. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, you don't want to brag, but you know, to behold the number one and two spot is a very special achievement. Yeah. So, so uh, this is the part where I'm I'm sure we have to kind of you know talk, uh, and I would say talk the fans down, but but it's tempting for many people to say like, oh, well, you're a made man now. You're just gonna uh, <laughs> uh, be successful and have all the money. Congratulations! The lightning struck. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but I mean, you're looking at the beginning of a very, very long, very involved journey, right? Yeah, I so to give you an example on uh, Friday, 
you know, the book, by the time I think I talked to Erica, the book was number three or number two or whatever. And my, my Erica was over the moon. And Erica's a wonderful agent. Like I said, Erica worked with Michael Crichton, Hunter S. Thompson, you know, Robin Cook, et cetera. She's worked with just some great, great people. So I'm just flattered every time she calls me. And she's just a, a lovely, wonderful person. But Erica calls me up and she's, you know, New York agent. You know, she's like, now I know you want to celebrate, but now's the time you've got to work, you yeah. know, and, and yeah. it's true. And that's why I love her is that she does not blow smoke. She just up parts. She is very serious. She's very loving, but she's a very, now we've got to work. She says, you know, we need to, you know, we want to get deals for these things. We got to get this stuff in a place. We got to go do that. And that's, you know, I spent the weekend, as you know, I was heavily on Periscope, working on outlines and just, just getting stuff done because it doesn't last. You know, I, every time I clicked there and I saw, you know, naturalist at number one, I'm like, this is great. Enjoy this for the moment. You don't get to stay there, you know. And then yesterday, you know, when I saw that uh, it finally, I, I, you know, went to number number two, which uh. is silly. It's stupid to be like, oh, number two. Um, and Teresa Driscoll's book, by the way, I am watching you, which is getting great response, great review. She's, you know, number one spot. You're like, that's fine. This is the way it works. This is the way it works, you know. Um, and then back to number one today, you know, you're like, wow, okay, but let's not obsess over that, but let's keep pushing and promoting, but let's focus on next. What's our next? Because now's the time to go out there and to try to make sure that I can have a successful book next year. Mo Looking Glass comes out in March. I want people to love Naturalist and go to Looking Glass. I'm trying to get a couple other titles lined up for next year, but I got to do that now. Publishing is so slow. Uh, yeah, let me, let me, that blows me away. Let, 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 let me ask you this. Uh, when you go through the, 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 you know, with Jessica Blackwood, you, you, with, with Bourbon Street Books, you had the traditional publishing experience, which is specifically, I think, for so many people that begin self publishing, this is the, the, uh, uh, a, a crowning achievement, something that you, that you really want to, uh, uh cherish. And now, uh, uh, that you have, have uh, experienced that, uh, you are, uh, uh, with, uh, you know uh, Thomas and Mercer with with Naturalist, and and this is happening to you now. Uh, how how would you compare, kind of uh, working, uh, you know, re releasing those books and and then coming in and doing these? You know, every what makes what sets publishers apart can be they can have a house style of what a book is. When I first went with Harper Collins, I was with Bourbon Street Books, which is an imprint, which is sort of this mystery imprint there. And, and they go for this is what their brand is, this is what they're doing there. And uh, I think the last book just was a general HarperCollins thriller mystery release. But, you know, everybody has their different approach. And and sometimes it overlaps, sometimes it's similar. I'm a person that grew up in sort of the online world of promotion. And so most of my thinking tends to be like, well, I get on a live stream and I talk about it here. I get on a podcast, I do this there, whatever. You know, Harper, Harper – you know, has kind of a more of an old school approach to that, which was different for me. But part of why the way Harper works is why, you know, I probably got the Thriller Award nomination. You know, yeah. part of the reason they work is that they look at they look at these awards, they look at these things. And I'm not to say that Thomas and Mercer doesn't submit. To, I don't know. But I know they have their different approaches. And it's just trying to adapt to the different ways in which they work, you know. Um, you know, and the challenge for me is that a lot of the old school way is like, hey, we want you to go to this conference here. We want you to go to this conference there. And I'm a guy that looks at things as like pure points of efficiency. I'm like, well, I can do a Periscope stream and I'll probably get 135 people that will watch the first couple minutes of it. And so if I'm talking about my book, they'll see that. I'll end up with about a 30 or 40 person audience, which if I do a book appearance someplace, granted, those are book buyers more likely to buy a book. But I can do a couple Periscopes. You know, you just sort of I have this sort of approach towards it. I don't know what's right or wrong. You know, you just got to keep doing things. Well, no, so I, th learn. I think you do bring up a really good point. Uh, I was talking to my uh, brother about this earlier today. Um, uh, there's power in the word no. Um, yes is very often associated with stress and freaking out and, and finding yourself bound to things. Uh, no is often associated with uh, uh, peace and tranquility and having your act together and so on. Um, uh, I, I, I am truly trying to endeavor uh, to say no more often to a lot of stuff because uh, because your time matters. Your time is your most limited, least scalable resource that you have. It's the most important thing you have. And uh, I think all of us, especially entrepreneurs, in the early days, yes, you do want to hustle. 
but but as you mature, I think I think it becomes I think there may be more power in saying no to a lot of stuff. Yeah, it depends. I mean, or coming up with let's try this. You know, I did a I did a book signing early on that I think the only people that showed up were people I knew, you know, maybe four or five other people there. And and, and it's a humiliating experience. It really is. You know, it, it's one of these things where you're used to if I was doing a magic show or performance or something different environment. I would have a very different reaction or reception. And, and, you know, I've been through like working on like as a magician, like building things up, going to open mic nights where there's nobody there. I'm not afraid of an empty audience or whatever, you know, but if I have a choice to say what will get me what I want to do, you know, and, and I'm not ruling out bookstore appearances, things like that. But, you know, I, I did one where the bookstore owner is like, well, why didn't you bring more people? And it was like... <laughs> Your why do I if what are you bringing me then you know if if you're up and I'm like I know it was just that sort of like and I'm like I never want to deal with that again I never want a bookstore owner to to blame me or say something to me and I'm like I'm like I'm like and this was in like a ritzy area or whatever I'm like I don't know anybody who can afford to live here you know yeah and and it was just that that kind of response to me was like to have that like we did you this favor mentality when again uh, you know I've done other bookstores that have been super great or whatever but. It's it's a mixed thing, and you have to say what's the most efficient use of my time to go out and promote. And you know, sometimes you have to say yes. You want to say no. You have to say yes, though, just because you don't know. But other times, you know, you get asked like, "Oh, could you go do this thing?" And I'm like, "That's going to take me two days. What's the impact?" I'm like, "Oh, we don't really know." I'm like, "So you just sat around and thought up something for me to do?" And you go through this TV and other stuff. Like you guys are just thinking, "What can we do?" And I wasn't part of that conversation. And now you're telling me you want me to do this thing. And again, this is a generalized sort of thing. And it's like, if it's thought through, I'll do it. And then sometimes you appear difficult, <laughs> you know, and, and it's, that's the problem is you've got to be like, I want to, I will. And it's people who know me, know me, I will work my ass off. But yeah. if it's a, the committee says, oh, let's go do this. It's like, did you think it through? You know, is that because. Well, yeah. I, you know, the, part of the reason why I asked the question was because. I know your process. I know your playbook. I know what your instincts are. And I do think that when you go into a different system that then tells you, please sub subvert, uh, you know, that, that this is our process. This is how we've always done it. This is how stars are made. Everyone you've ever known and loved has followed this process. You say, okay, yeah, you want to know what? You guys, I, I hustled my way into the dance, and now and now here we go. And that works, and, and sometimes it doesn't work as well. Sometimes it works as well. It's a big, gigantic machine. There's a lot of cogs in it. Uh, but what I've really appreciated specifically about your process now is that it is, it's conducive to your playbook, if not uh, uh, you know something that, that you understood as soon as you got that push. As soon as the the, the, the the nitrous, you know, uh, hit in, and now you're sh you're shooting up to the top, you knew that the playbook is continue to activate your core audience to make sure that you can you can get reviews that you understand that the algorithm recognizes quality reviews that people are going to do. So if you've already uh, uh, hipped your your fan base to the fact that this is a book that they can review, now go ahead and do it. Uh, that you want to make sure that you're engaging your core audience by doing all these periscopes, by sending out your emails. This is the stuff you've built your career on. And it is exactly what you needed to do to not only get into the number one slot, but stay in the number one slot. And then when you when you went back a little bit, go right back into the number one slot uh, uh, You know, uh, after a day, which shows to me not only the fact that Obviously, you're benefiting from this tremendous momentum that was that was gifted to you by the Amazon First program, but you are making the most of it. When opportunity knocks, you're chaining it to the radiator and making it, uh, uh, you know, do whatever you say. Which is, which is, I think, something that even if it's all just you turning a crank, that you don't know exactly what it does, and this is all going to be whatever it is, uh, uh, I think is is tremendously helpful that that your instincts are are rewarded yeah you, you uh, yes and you and i have to i as an author i have to understand the game and learn how it's played both with new publishers and traditional publishers because i want to work with both and, yeah. and and you know i 
I am very, very, very grateful. Traditional publishing helped me become a much better writer. Traditional publishing helped me get a foundation in understanding that and you know, what I do in that world is going to benefit from this. I want to be hybrid. I want to be, you know, traditional, indie, all these sorts of things. And so, you know, it's a, a you know, learning and trying to understand how does, how is traditional publishing adapting, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is, and this is uh, in, in, in no way to say that there, there is any wrong way to do it, you know? And, and yeah. uh, there is a, a tremendous, tremendous, I don't think there's ever going to be a time in which you are not working in all phases of publishing, which is a rapidly mm -hmm. changing industry. And, and, and this is in no way to say that, uh, uh, Harper Collins is anything other than the best possible partner and other traditional publishers can help you move things along because there is a tremendous, uh, 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 benefit, uh, that you are going to have then now and forever, uh, uh working with them. Uh, Everybody, everybody's trying to figure out, you know, what, what works. And one of the reasons like I wanted to go with traditional publishing and uh, initially and go with a publisher in general, you know, go with the publisher in general was if I, I, I like doing indie books, I like doing station breaker things like because time frame, I can just release these on my own and put them out there. But if a book becomes a hit or a success or something really, really popular, you know, uh, you know, you take a book like, you know, uh, Angel Killer, you know, it made sense for me to say, OK, you know, the next phase of this book, you know, you want to have having a traditional publisher is helpful. You know, the, the case of The Naturalist, the reason I, you know, going to the publisher on this and being able to take advantage of that is I would not be on this position on my own. I would not be on this position on my own. I've had other books do really well, but I know it took other people fighting for it and pushing it the other way. I got, you know, that Thriller Award finalist thing came from publishing, publishers at Harper saying, take a look at this guy, take a look what he's done. The Naturalist getting selected for what it is now was, you know, my editor, you know, I had two different editors, uh, Jackie, who was the first one who picked it up and Liz, who's the one now, both of them, you know, one inherited the book from the other, but they both are very passionate about Theo Cray. And I was so lucky, so lucky to have that nice handoff from there. I've been in situations where, you know, an editor has left in the launch of a book and it's like, you're literally feel like a foster kid. You know, you feel like you're at a homeless shelter and it's not it's not a fun feeling. But yeah, no. I, and, and I've gone through that in television. You know, you have a champion mm -hmm. who brings you in on a project. And then the champion leaves. And now somebody is just inherited and they have ideas that aren't at all the project that you had originally envisioned. We've talked about some of this stuff before, but but it's uh, it's it matters. It matters to have people on your team. It matters to have a platform and it matters to keep that momentum going. Yeah. And, you know, I'm. You know, the, the 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 best things in my life that have ever had happened to me, maybe it started with me being excited and doing it on my own, but it happened when other people came along and wanted to help carry it along. You know, in writing, it was Justin helping me become a better writer. It was Brian and everybody else saying, let's use our platform to promote these things. It was getting everybody else excited about it and helping to carry that. And and that's then that's you've got to you've got to be doing something interesting, not wait for people to go you know, hold out their hands waiting for this thing. But once they see that you're doing something cool, publishing, you know, it's been, you know, Erica, my agent, it's been, you know, Liz over at Amazon, uh, at Amazon Publishing, Thomas and Mercer, et cetera. So, you know, it was, you know, helping to become a better writer. Hannah, I'm very lucky that I've had these people that just, you know, push that over there. And and I get a, I get to sit bask in this like, hey, everybody, look at me. But the reality is I had a lot of luck, a lot of luck, but you improve your chances of luck by doing more things. Yeah, and understand, like, luck goes, uh, not only do you improve your chances, but on a large enough scale, you build multi-million dollar empires. Like, uh, casinos, uh, they understand that with enough hands of poker, they can they can get investors uh, who, yeah. who reliably will know uh, how much money they can depend on. We, we... When we launched, you know, we're selling magic books and DVDs. At that time, we knew the market was anything would sell was reasonably well to sell at least 300 units. Yeah. And so we built a business model on that, that every product could break even at least 300 units. Anything over was profit. And that's how we gamed that system. That's how even even CDs that, you know, DVDs that I overbought, you know, a thousand units, whatever. We never lost money because we just kept at it. Kind yeah. of a Roger Corman sort of effect towards that. I could go to where, you know. I got rid of a warehouse and I threw away thousands of, of DVDs to sh do everything online because it made more sense just to use a drop shipper than to try to ship them somewhere. 
we gamed that. You know, with writing, I said, okay, step number one is become a good writer and keep evolving as a writer. Step number two is write an effing lot, even if it's not books that get released, but keep writing because you just improve your chances of doing, of success. Yep. And, you know, the, the lucky things have happened to me. And again, I got lucky. I got really, 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 really lucky. I'm here because there are other people who work very, very hard and harder. And in this particular instance, you know, I got, you know, the dice rolled my way. And I don't. Yeah, I'm not, I, I, I'll say this. Miracles happen to the prepared is one of my favorite yeah. phrases of all time. And uh, I like to think of life as at any given moment. Your the thing that happens that whisks you away to your dreams is there. It's just invisible because you're not ready for it because you haven't leveled up to the point where you're ready to catch that wind. And you have always had an A to Z approach on writing, even even before before it was for for what it is now. It was, hey, look, we can maybe make a little bit extra money if we sell X amount of these ebooks and it's going to take me y amount of time and we can make you know a couple extra hundred dollars or if, and if you look at it in context and in in uh, uh you know context of what else everything else we were selling hell that's that's good money everything uh everything contributes and if i keep writing them and you keep multiplying what that means then that makes that much money there was a success there right and then it got bigger and then it was agents and then it was oh wow it looks uh, look look at Movie rights seem to be coming in for ebooks because everyone's just looking for original IP. And if you chart well enough, then you get people sniffing around. And that's the kind of stuff that just keeps getting renewed year after year. So let's write things that are cinematic. Let's write things that, that we know uh, uh, could could fit into that context. Like, that's cool. So let's write there. Let's And then it became Angel Killer. Where it was like, and, and by the way, not all of them were, were exactly, you know, uh, like, oh, write it, success. Chronological Man is a great example of, of uh, a path in which you followed, and it was great books, and I really enjoy them. I think that they're fantastic reads for everybody, but that was a, a direction for you as an author that it was like, oh, okay, let, let's, let's try Angel Killer now. Let's try uh, a, more, a more mainstream idea. Still the number one book I get asked for outside of Angel Killer if I'm going to do more. Yeah, and I because it's great because I love it. It's my I, it's it's some of my favorite stuff. Hell, it has Teddy Roosevelt shooting monsters. Like that's that's my <laughs> that's my jam, right? Like that's yeah. that's exactly what I like in life. Uh, but it was like, all right, let's let's think, let's think where the next win is, and it's gonna go from A to Z. It's going. There is a beginning, a middle, and an end, and we're going to see where it goes, and we're gonna see if there's there's something beyond it, but. You know, Angel Killer was very deliberately thought out and, and everything from that point has been, including, by the way, the books that I've read where they may never see the light of day. They might see the light of day if, they, if you know, uh, where entire concepts, entire characters, entire worlds have evolved books on books. And they're just not, you know, they're they're they're, they're not there yet. Right. You yeah. And that's that's a great point to bring up. It's like I share my successes with the world. I hide my failures and the failures far, far outnumber the successes. And, uh, you know, I've had books that I've given to my agent. Just tried to see if the publisher's interested. In it, and they're like, no, you know, not not for us. I've had that happen numerous times. You know, I keep wanting to break into the middle grade in the YA market, you know, and that's not happened. You know, I have not done that, you know, and, and that's so an example of like, Hey, it must be great being me. It's like, you know, like if you saw the number of times I get rejection, it's far, far, you know, more than the chances I get yay me. Uh, and I've had, you know, the name of the devil, I wrote that book and then I rewrote an entirely different version of it because I wasn't sure about it. And then the first one ended up being the better one and actually got my best critical, you know, clades accolades rather and then you know the naturalist you know i gave that to my agent and i think we took it out and i think i did a, i did i think i did an entirely new pass on it based on feedback from it but even then it was hard to find you know i had you know a publisher we had in mind for it and they just flat out rejected it and it was like and they're like oh we'd like to see you do something in this space and it was like a it was not even maybe you could tweet it was like nope sorry door slammed kind of in your face and it hurt that hurt because it was like didn't it wasn't because i expected them to pick it up but it was like well i had a conversation about this book and and you you wasted no time in telling me no. Even I changed what I was writing to make you guys happy. That was a little frustrating. But 
now and again everybody's oh, acting with their own how you like me now though <laughs> no nah, but i mean everybody has to do they have to everybody has to make the right decisions and stuff you know i've exactly, made exactly exactly and and i and it worked out better for the book what happened to it and i think the people there are happy for me that like yeah it didn't end up there and what happened with it and now with the naturalist number one i'm just saying you can be you can be uh 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 the the uh uh, uh, uh well, we, we can do the key and peel Obama translator <laughs> routine, you know. I, yeah. I'll just I'll just dance next to you about about the, the path of the naturalist. Uh, hey guys, I gotta uh, I gotta put together the rest of these slides for this TED. Uh, talk yeah. Tomorrow. Uh, but my pick is the the naturalist. Uh, I think I think all of our pick is the naturalist available now on Amazon. Uh, uh please 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 go get it if you are a Prime subscriber, you can get it for free. Uh, so, uh, real quick, one of the nice little perks is when your book launches, your publisher traditionally sends you a nice little present or something like a little. They call it like your book birthday kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I received in the mail. I wasn't expecting anything. I opened it up, and from Thomas and Mercer, they sent me the Kindle Oasis, which is the fancy schmancy Kindle. Nice. It it's leather case, and it lasts. The battery lasts for like forever. It actually has a battery built into the case and it's, you know, super sharp, 300 DPI screen, et cetera. So this is really cool. If you want, cool. you, <clears throat> you want the Tesla model X of Kindles, <laughs> of Kindles. This is the way to go. Grab the Kindle well, congratulations, man. Uh, all right, everybody. I would uh, highly recommend that you go ahead and follow at Andrew main on Twitter. I know that he is periscoping his face off, uh, uh, making sure that everybody knows about this. And if you want a chance to ask him any question about, the Naturalist, writing, publishing, anything. That man is an open book, to pardon the pun. Uh, so go ahead and check that out. Uh, we are out of time, though. Andrew. Guys, thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, these two people who are right now, Justin and Brian, uh, they're the wind beneath my wings, one for each wing. And <laughs> I am very, very, very grateful for both the public and the private support, the, the, the brainstorming sessions that I... Both of them help me out immensely as we analyze what works in the world, what not. The, hey, I need a favor kind of thing. I'm very, very grateful. And to all of you. I have a writing career because of the listeners to Weird Things and Ergo After Things. That's why I have this. It was the first audience. You guys were the ones that infected everybody else. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it, does men it does bear mention that right now the number one author on Amazon in his bio lists that he is the host of the Weird Things podcast. So, awesome. That's awesome. I'm very Jeez. proud of it. Gentlemen, it's been an after. Yeah. Oh. All righty. All right. Cool beans, guys. Uh, well, I got to hustle and get to my physical therapy appointment. So, I will talk to you guys uh, later. Bye. Sweet. Thank you, Brian. Good luck. All right, guys. See you later.